All right, now I'm going to just take a minute. We are going to pray for our students uh, from kindergarten all the way through 12th grade, for our administrators, our staff, our teachers that will be teaching not only in Sanger in the early service. I made a mistake of saying just Sanger. I didn't think about the fact that we have people in our church that teach in places other than Sanger. Um, and so if you are an administrator in a public school, a private school, or if you are homeschooling, I'm going to ask you to stand. If you are a teacher, administrator, staff in any capacity in the education system, if you would stand. And if our, any of our students that are going kindergarten through 12th grade, if uh, you would stand, we're going to just take a minute to pray for you. Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, Lord, we lift up these who are going back to school tomorrow. Our Father, we know that many of our, our principals, our teachers, our staff have been hard at work over the last weeks getting ready for this for tomorrow. Father, I pray that you would have them ready not only to teach the, the lessons of reading, writing, and math, and science, and history, but Father, also, more importantly, uh, to teach our young boys and girls about character. Father, I pray that as our teachers and staff and administrators, as they go about their day, Lord, I pray that you would always remind them that their number one priority is to make an impact on the lives of these young men and women that are under their care. But Father, for our students, Lord, I pray that, yes, we pray that they would learn the math, the science, and all the other subjects. But Father, I pray that they would make an impact, that they would use their schooling as an opportunity to share your love with those around them. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Please be seated. You know, the, uh, this series on forgiveness, I'm going to just tell you right up front, you are going to walk out of here today and you're not going to have the answers. I want to make sure we're very clear on it. I am not going to give you the answers to the problems that we have today. There's a couple of reasons for it. One, I don't have the time. It would take too long to give you the answers to first, but before we even get the answers, we've got to realize that there is a problem and we've got to start dealing with the problem. And so if I tried to just jump into the answers, you would not have taken the time to realize that there are probably, for the majority of us, there are issues in our life that we need to take care of. And so today, we're going to set the scope, we're going, to, we're going to help each of us to recognize the own bitterness, the grudges, the alienation that we have in our own life. I'll tell you a story. I had a friend that was a pastor in Washington. Uh, he told me this story that he received a phone call from a family in North Carolina. His family called, and, and they had an uncle that lived in our area, in the area there. And they said, would you please go make contact with this uncle? Because we have tried for the last 50 years to contact him. We had, we had tried to find him. We finally found him. We tried to make contact. He'll have nothing to do with us. And we don't understand what the problem is. So Fred, my Pastor Fred, he asked. He got a little more information. He found out that this individual, at the age of 18, had joined the Navy had gone and served in World War II, had come back and had uh, been stationed in California. Finally, it came his time, he got out of the Navy, and when he got out of the Navy, he just promptly disappeared. And then the family tried for all these years, they had tried to contact him, they tried to find him, because they wanted to make back a connection, and because they, they really, truly did not know what the problem was. Well, they finally tracked him down to a city called SeaTac. They had his address. They tried to call him, no response. So they called Fred. They found Fred through the American Legion work that he had done, and they asked if he'd go. So Fred goes to the house, and then he said as he pulls up to the, to, the, to the trailer park, he pulls up to the trailer house that he lived in, he said it was one of those situations where when you walked up to the house, he said you, you could almost literally smell and feel the anger and the bitterness. He said it was as if you walked up and it was just like this wall of anger just that was just dripping out of this trailer house. And he said, I can't really explain it any better than that. 
He said, you just as you walked up, you could just feel it. It's like you could smell it. And, and he said, so he went, knocks on the door. A lady comes to the door. He asked if this individual was home. He said, yes. He asked if he could speak to her. So this man comes up, and, and Fred said, as he walked to the door, he said, you could see where that smell and that, that bitterness that was in the house, he said, you could just see as he walked up, you could see where it came from. The man walks up and says, what do you want? Fred explains that he had been contacted by his family in North Carolina. And he said, as he mentioned his family in North Carolina, he said, you could just see this man getting more angry and more angry. And, and Fred said, that they really would like to find out. They'd like to make some contact with you. They'd like to talk with you. I don't want to talk with you. He said, well, can, we, you know, can, can you tell me what it is that's caused this? And he said, well, they know. They know. And Fred said, you know, I spent some time talking to them on the phone, and they really don't know. And the last thing the man said as he slammed the door in Fred's face was, oh, they know. He slammed the door and turned around and walked off. Fred sat wondering, what in the world caused this anger? What caused that bitterness, that, that alienation, that separation? They were found out. You know, there is another story that we have all read. The story that is found in Genesis chapter 3. It's a story of perfection. A story of perfect innocence. A story of perfect intimacy. It's a story of Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve lived together in paradise. The word garden of Eden uh, in its original language is actually paradise. They, they lived in perfect harmony together. There was, there was no problems in the world. There were no problems between them. Everything was perfect. Until Eve was deceived by the serpent. And she took off of the tree. The one tree in the garden that she was not to eat from. She took and she ate. And her husband Adam, who was with her, ate. And when they ate, of that fruit, there came this wall of separation. Not just between the two of them, but between them and God. And, and all of the perfection that they had been living in was shattered. We read in Genesis chapter 3, beginning in verse 8, it says that then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the cool garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. You know, just stop right there for a minute. God came down as was his custom. It was his normal habit. God came down physically. And he walked in the garden. They, they could feel his presence. They were with God every day in the cool of the evening. There was perfection. And then this day... When God comes down, they hid. But the Lord God called to the man, Where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked. So I hid. Alienation happened. Separation happened because of sin. For Adam and Eve, the sin was eating from the one tree that God had told them not to. But we know from experience that, that separation, that alienation, frustration, grudges, all of those different words that we could use, we all know that it happens for so many different reasons. You know, in the skit this morning, we, don't ever, we never found out the guy who had the grudge held against them is saying, I think I slighted her. I think. I'm not really sure. So many times that's what it's like. So many times we don't even really know what it is that's causing the anger, the bitterness, the frustration. There's another story of 
two people became alienated and separated. It's the story of a man who was the first king of Israel, a man named Saul, and a man who worked for him, called David. Now David was a shepherd boy, and Israel was in a battle. We were in a fight against the Philistines. And David's dad sent him, sent his son to the battlefield with some food for his brothers. David comes, and, and as he gets there, he hears this, this giant Philistine named Goliath who is mocking Israel. He's mocking Israel's God. He's mocking Israel's army. And he's saying to them, come out and fight me. And, and, it, and David looks and says, who is this? And I love the way he says it. Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that is mocking God and his army? And so David is the one that has the courage, and he goes out with his slingshot and his stones, and he kills the, he kills the giant Goliath, and Israel wins the battle, and the people celebrate. And right after that, in the book of the Bible, it says that, that the women say, David has, or Saul has killed his thousands. But David, his tens of thousands. And Saul became jealous and bitter. And that bitter pill that David swallowed, that Saul swallowed, it began to just grow. That, that separation, that anger, that, that alienation, it all begins to grow. And he grows a grudge against David. And he grows so vicious, so violent. That he tries to kill David, not once, not twice, but numerous times. And all throughout this, King Saul, who, who lives in a, a luxury, he lives in the palace of Israel. He's got everything. He thinks that he's got it good. But really, Saul was the one that's held in prison. He's imprisoned by his bitterness towards David. And that bitterness just grows until it finally consumes Saul completely. And the one who is hiding in the wilderness, living in a stronghold, running for his life, the one that most of us would look at and say, between the two, between Saul living in luxury and, and David living out in the wilderness, most of us would say, well, of course it is, it is King David, or it is David that is that is held in, in the in a prison, that, that it is David that is suffering. But when you read the story of Saul and David, David is not suffering. The man that is suffering is Saul. Why? Because Saul is holding on to this grudge. Now Saul is holding on to his bitterness against David, his jealousy. And he won't let it go. For whatever slights that he has imagined that David has done him, he will not forgive him. Because of that, it's Saul that's held in prison. We could go on with many other stories, but I'm going to tell you just a piece of one more. It is why this sermon series was written. A number of years ago, we had an incident in the church that I served. And I'm going to tell you the whole story in about six weeks. But it was a hard time. There was one particular man that hurt me bad. <laughs> and we got all of this problem solved. Everything got resolved, taken care of within the church. I thought it was done. I thought it was finished. Until I was sitting in a class from a doctoral program. And a professor gave us an assignment to write a paper. To write a paper about individuals in our lives that had made a, a major impact on us. And he told us as we write, wrote this paper, he said, no, normally when you write a paper for me, it's got to be in, in perfect formatting. You go back, you write a rough draft, you go back and you fix it up. And, you know, you, you make sure that you outline everything and you want it in perfect form, perfect English, all of that stuff. He said, this paper, I don't want you to do that. He said, this paper, I want you just to list out the people that you're going to write about. And then I want you to sit down and either type it or write it. And he said, I want you just to let what is on your heart and on your mind just flow onto the paper. I said, okay. 
So I went and I wrote about some men from my years growing up and the impact that it had on my life. I want to tell you it was easy because it's easy to talk about people that have had a positive impact. You know, the road words were flowing and I was writing about them and just talking about the, the things that they had done in my life. But then I got down to one last person. And as I started to, as I wrote his name, and I started to type out what I thought of this man, I looked on the paper, I looked on my computer screen, and what I had written was, I hate this man. Well, of course, being a good Christian and a pastor, I was like, oh, no, 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 I can't put that. So I hit that delete key, you know, I backspaced all the way through that. I was like, no, i got to change that. I've got to find some more appropriate, more Christian way of saying it. So I sat there on my computer, and all of a sudden my fingers started typing again. And I looked back at the screen, and what I had written was, I really hate this man. <laughs> I was like, I tried, and I tried. I think I deleted that line like 10, 20, 30 times. And every time I would type it, it came out something like, I really hate this man. And I went on, and I talked about that. You know, if, if I see him coming down the street, that I will go to the other side of the street to make sure I don't have to talk to him. I began to realize that, that I had had to see him at a, at a funeral and some other things. Every time I saw him, folks, I got sick to my stomach. I was so angry. And yet I wasn't willing to admit that I had to deal with him. And so I said in the class, and we had to read these papers to our class. And I read, and I go through the other guys, you know, and I can see everybody nodding their head, and they're going, yeah, that's great, that's cool. You know, yeah, those, those, that same kind of things happen in my life. And then I get to the last part, and I just kind of buried my head in the paper. And I read, I read that I hate this man. And I could just tell that the guys in my class were going, Ooh, wait a second. We got to the end of it. I looked up, and they all looked at me, and they said, Grant, you got to deal with that. I said, I know. I will eventually. Well, I didn't know that eventually it was going to come as quickly as it did. Because at the end of this class, we all had to write a paper. And most everybody in this class, everybody else got to choose their topic. I was the only one, and the professor looked at me and said, Grant, you're going to write about forgiveness. And I went, why? And he said, because you need it. So Grant, I want you to write, he wants you to study how to forgive. I want you to write your paper on forgiveness. I said, okay. So I went home, I got my Bible out, and I started studying. I went through the concordances and everything else, trying to figure out all of the verses and talk about forgiveness, not just us being forgiven by God, which is the most important thing that can happen in our life, but, but us learning to forgive those around us, to forgive those that have hurt us. And I, I read every verse that I could find in the Bible on that. Then I started picking up books. I ordered a bunch of books, and I started going through these stacks of books, and, and I started reading, and, and I read so many books on forgiving and being forgiven and forgiving others. It all kind of began finally to, to come together. And I wrote that paper, and I got to tell you, I got the best grade I've ever gotten on a paper, on that paper. Not because the professor wrote A on the paper or whatever they give you in that program. That wasn't the best grade. The best grade was what it did in me. Because as I wrote that paper, I had to go through the process, the steps that we're going to be talking about over the next few weeks. My prayer for you is that you will leave at the end of this six weeks, that you will be able to say that I have forgiven those that I hold the against. But here's my challenge for you. When you leave today, I'm going to ask you to take to make a list. And I want you to make a list of everyone in your life, living or dead, 
near or far away, it does not matter. I want you to make a list of those that you have bitterness towards, that you hold a grudge towards, that you're separated from. Those that you recognize you need to forgive, or maybe you think they need to forgive you. Whatever it is that, that causes some kind of separation. I want you to make a list. The first thing I want you to do is to write their names. And when we sing in a little bit, you know, my invitation when we sing this morning isn't going to be if y'all come down here and, and get saved, y'all come down and pray. We're really not going to give that kind of invitation. The invitation I'm going to give you this morning is as we sing, I want you to take out a pen, a piece of paper, a pencil, whatever it is, and I want you to start writing names. I want you just to make a list today of those that you have got problems with, those that you're separated from. I want you to write down the names. And then when you go home, what I want you to do this week is I want you to add flesh to the names. Because just a list of names is one thing. But I'm going to ask you to go back and do what I had to do for that paper. To write out why is it that you're separated from them. Why is it that you are so bitter towards them? Why is it that when you hear their name or you see them, that, that the bile starts to rise in your stomach? What is it that has caused the separation? And I want you to write those out. Get as in-depth as you can. And here's why I'm not giving you the answers today. Because until we get it all out, we really can't deal with it. What we do too often as Christians is we forgive on the surface level. We deal with everything on the surface level. And we don't drill down deep. I want to tell you, when you get poison in your body, the only way to get the poison out is to cut it out and to let it get out. And I want to tell you, it hurts. It hurts when we start to dig down deep, we start to drill down and, and really get into the poison and the bitterness that is there. It hurts to do it. And so I'm going to tell you, yes, I am going to cause you pain this week. If you will take what I tell you to do, if you will go back and you will make that list, and you will go out and write out that list and get as detailed as you possibly can about the anger, the bitterness, the separation that is there, it's going to hurt. I wish that I could tell you today that, that don't worry about it. It's going to be easy. It's not. It's going to hurt. And, and there's probably going to be some times this week when you're going to be madder than you've ever been. Because as we begin to really dig down into those things in our life, that, that poison starts bubbling out. And as it starts coming out, that poison hurts. But there's hope. Because after this week, we're going to start talking about how to get rid of it. But again, you've got to bring it up. You've got to lay it out on the table. And if we don't lay it out on the table, you're never going to get over it. So my challenge for you this week is to take it out, to lay it on the table, and get real, get honest with it. Get honest with the anger, the bitterness that is in your life. Don't do like we so often do and just cover it over it. Because if you cover over a wound that is infected, and you just cover it over, we all know what happens. The infection spreads. And the infection will spread to the point that it will kill you. An ancient Chinese proverb says that he who plots revenge should dig two graves. I want to tell you, he who holds a grudge should dig two graves. One for whoever it is you're going to get revenge against, and one for you. Because if you hold that revenge, you hold that anger, it will put you in the grave. It will destroy your life. So this week, pull it out. Lay that frustration out. Write it out. Tell God about it. Get honest with it. Because it is only then 
that we can begin to seek reconciliation. Some of you may be sitting here today and you may be thinking, you know, when I write my list, there's going to be one big thing. And it's going to be a name that we don't like to, to get honest about. Some of you today, one of the names that's going to be top on your list might very well be God. Might very well be that you recognize that you are angry at God because of something that has happened in your life. I want to tell you, it's okay. It is okay for you to admit that you are angry at God. The reality is this. Our God is big enough that he can handle your anger. But he's not going to force you to deal with it until you are willing to. When I went through all that I went through, when my family has gone through some other things, there have been times that I would say, yes, I was angry at God. And it's only when I went through those steps to come back to God and pour it out to Him why I was so angry at it. And my heart began to heal. So my challenge for you, even if it is God that you're angry at, pour it out. Write it down in all of its ugliness. Lay it on the table before it. And come back next Sunday and let's start talking about how to do it. And it's going to take us six weeks to go through this whole process. But let me tell you, there is hope. So as we sing today, I'm going to ask you to stand as we sing, but what I encourage you to do is as we sing, write down names. Put the names down today, and then this week, put, put the flesh to those names. Write them out. Get on us. Our Father in heaven, Lord, I know that you can bring healing. Father, I know that we need healing. Lord, I know that I personally need your healing every day. Father, I pray for everyone in this congregation this morning. Lord, I pray that they would be healed by your spirit. And we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Let's stand and sing together.